leader of particularity. So, is there any other category that would, which is a, a, has, has had a, a, a strong, has resonated within our contemporary and contemporary thought, such as the singular, and Judith Butler also talks about singularity, etc., etc. So, what is there of any use to go back to, to take hold of this category to think those issues? This is one question. Should I wait for you? Yes, uh, um, you, you, you have in Hegel, you, you have this triple movement of the universal, the particular, and the single. So it, it comes, I mean, the dialectics of universality runs out of the, into the question of the singular, but which for Hegel is the vanishing level. There's something, the right to the singularity, the persingularity of something, it's when the thing evaporates, reverses itself. And in, in, in a good way, in many ways, because uh, if, if one wants to redeem the singularity, and this is Kierkegaard's question, mm -hmm. it would have to be singularity without that, as, as opposed to that. Yeah. Because when you usually say singularity, one thinks, well, this is my, uh, this is the epitome of my event. Mm -hmm. This is the most identical thing that I have and it really makes me me. I mean, the, the singular individuality that I am is this question. And in Kierkegaard, you can see precisely that singularity as such is the disruptive mood. It's not, it's not an object you can hold on to. And object A in the con is well, the thing, the generic thing for this. The, the object of pure singularity is always absolutely singular. But it has no problem. Nevertheless, uh, it is the substance of the joint. It's the very substance of the joint. So, yes. So it could be helpful. It could be helpful. Yes, yes, yes. If you want to in this way. No, no. If you want to in this way, yes, yes. In Virginia Butler, I'm never sure. I mean, what she. No, no, I mean, mean, she, she, she somehow. That's not a thing. That's not the object A. No, it's, no, not a, it's not the object A. Exactly. That, she, that she is in the politics of identity, basically. She's still within the paradigm of politics of identity, which is, which I think is a different paradigm. Yes. 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 And the second question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You were speaking at, in the end, when actually you were putting your, like showing those two ways of two models of two paradigms for understanding the relationship between culture and nature. But before you spoke about the relationship between inner and talent. And you spoke about Eros and the of course, and precisely taking into account this displacement. Um, but in the end, you, you, I mean, it comes with this image of Eros being this unifying blue, you said, and Thanatos being this dissolution, preventing any unity. Would it be, because the question that um, raised when, when I was listening to you was, then I think you, you sort of gave an answer to that question. But I would like to comment a little bit more on that. What kind of, what kind of dialectics is there operating there? I mean, to me, between and Thanatos. I mean, it is indeed a different kind of dialectics if we take into account the first consideration of Eros by Freud and the second consideration of Eros by Freud. So what this displacement of, uh, of conception of Eros also implies a displacement into the, these logics of, of this dialectical um, relationship. So this, the question was, was this, I mean, what, what kind of dialectic is operating here? I mean, and what are the implications of that shift for this uh, operation of dialectics between these two forces? Well, uh, when Freud first introduced the, the, the notion of drive, this was 1905 in the, in the three essays. And it was, um, at, at the time, it was a sort of a, a revolutionary move, an unexpected move, because uh, you can see that uh, the first three books that he wrote, the Tom Guide and the book on uh, jokes, the book on psychology, the 
life, they deal with the unconscious structure as a language. And they're, they're very tightly connected with the language problem, and the unconscious always appears as a linguistic twist, as a linguistic slip, in, in dreams or in, in the slips or in the jokes. And there's the same mechanism of displacement. And then when Freud writes the three essays on the theory of sexuality, it's, it's like it's a book from another planet. Because language doesn't appear at all. You know, there's, there's no problem with language. There's a problem suddenly of the body and the bodily apertures. And how the drive moves along the bodily apertures and what is the, the, so the logic of the accumulation of the emerges the condition of frissance involved in this. As if, as if there was no language. As if the first three books were not written. As if there was no problem of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. The problem is suddenly the problem of libido and how the libido would get a satisfaction. And how we one would progress <coughs> and why we would progress from the oral to the anal to the genital. Or is this uh, is this a problem? So, so there's something in the, in the Freudian notion of the drive which is completely unexpected in relation to his beginnings, in relation to his very famous three sort of uh, founding books. He sort of shifts the landscape. It's a different landscape. And there's a huge problem. How, how one would configure? I mean, this sort of a million-dollar question seems like a madness. Does this hang together? How one would configure the theory of drives with the theory of the unconscious. They're, they're two different things. And Freud himself tried then to shift things in the second topics and uh, do another kind of uh, re rewriting of, uh, of the beginnings. And um, um, I think only Lacan came eventually up with a certain kind of view of it. And his view of this was that uh, you have a uh, a certain logic in the unconscious which is logical desire, which uh, uh, <coughs> Freud insists through the time diving that dreams are the wish fulfillment, the fulfillment of desire, which is a one kind of entity attending the unconscious, and the subject of the unconscious is the subject of desire, and this is content. And then you have the logic of the drives, multiple non-totalizable drives, which have no subject. There's no subject to the drives. It's an asubjective entity. And um, when Freud then tries to make the second topic with the ideas of the ego, he also reconfigures the question of the drives in these two opposing forces, the errors and the planetos. And uh, what Lacan did is not, is not to see the major conflict as the way that uh, Freud conceived it among two types of drives. And Lacan suddenly says, there is but one drive, which is the death drive. The death drive is the same as libido. It's the problem that Freud never would admit to. Mm -hmm. Libido, death drive, same thing. Which would mean to drive is something which connects and disconnects at the same time. So th this is the paradoxical entity. That is the entity that separates, that cuts, that severs. But this cut is at the same time the unifying principle. This is sort of the Hegelian movement. In the same place, you see the severance and the, and the connection. The same thing severs and connects. And uh, then the problem, in, in this way, displaced the basic conflict uh, from this Freudian view of libido uh, versus, versus uh, the death drive into a kind of structural conflict between the drives and desire. The drives and desire are two, uh, two entry points, but you get completely different logic. If you get to the logic of desire, which is the logic of the unconscious, have a desire as this principle of negativity which is never satisfied. Meaning the 
desire is this eternal, this is not it. Whatever you do, I mean, you and somehow the ethics of desire, this not to be out of one desire, would mean never be satisfied with any it as the object which could be adequate to your desire. But if you make the entry point from the point of view of drives, I mean, the drives have the opposite logic of this is always it. It's, a, it's so easy. You, you, you know, you, you, you have this fixation. You know, you, you have this, um, this, this uh, glue, as it were, function of the drive. It gets so easily glued to any source of sense. There's no way in, 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 in the logic of desire to have the question, you never get to the race discussion. You will never get to the fulfillment of desire. In the drive, you have the opposite problem. You can't be rid of satisfaction. Whatever you do, you will always enjoy. You give up enjoyment, you enjoy it more. And you enjoy it, <laughs> the perverse giving up of enjoyment. The renunciation of enjoyment creates more enjoyment. I mean, look at Christianity. I mean, this is clearly a religion of enjoyment. The more we renounce, the more we enjoy. The more we have this, the, this is okay, Nietzsche, the genealogy of morals. I mean, he, he gives a brilliant kind of Lacanian account of how renunciation breeds enjoyment. How you, you can't get out of it. So enjoyment is, kind of, is, is a kind of stain of human nature. You, you, whatever you do, the, this it will find its way to enjoy. You're doomed to enjoy. It's not that you aren't really enjoy. You're doomed. It's a terrible thing. You will always enjoy. Man is an enjoying machine. So you have these completely two completely different perspectives on the same thing. Whether you enter the entry point of desire or the entry point of desire. And this is kind of a, this is how the can then displaced the whole question of this. What is the best kind? Where is the best Some kind of wholeness, which is a Hegelian wholeness, with like what you said, you know, that I is equal to I, going through different uh, negativity, affected by nuclearly affected by this negativity. It could be thought of that, most probably. Or what do you think? Maybe not. Oh yes, no. Again, you raise a big question. What is a totality? Totality. What is interesting in here is that any totality is premised on the impossibility. And this it starts off from the impossibility. I mean, traditional, sub, traditional substantiality was the usual notion of totality. How to seize all by one. In Kaipan, this is a Hermenidian form. <coughs> Being can be one, and this is a philosophical. What is the zero philosophical problem? Like, how can you bring the diversity of being, all the facets, to a single principle? This is Starbucks. You just had one principle and encompass this in one. You know. And Hegel was very right of that. He, he's, he's the first, he's the man to precisely give up on one door. So it's a oneness which is not a oneness. It's a, it's a oneness which is not a oneness. And this is a paradoxical move. 
is, is this, I mean, can this be thought? Is this enough to say that split is primordial, but split prevents any oneness? It prevents any oneness. Yes, yes and Iliad alone is precisely uh, 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 the basic axiomatic claim to think of a one which is not one of the I mean, Iliad alone is, is to think of one which is not one of totality. And if, if you look at the French formulation, it's very paradoxical. You know, it's, it's a partitive object. You know? yes. Il y a de l'eau. You know? Il y a du pain. Il y a du pain. Mm -hmm. Which means that you have a, a non specified quantity of an uncountable act. This is mm -hmm. what means, you know, Il y a de l'eau. Mm -hmm. But then to say Il y a de l'eau, you know, you have an unspecified quantity. <laughs> What is one? one, which is the very definition of quantity, you know, the measure of quantity. Mm -hmm. So this is, it's, it's a very nice formulation in French, and I don't know if you can capture it in Spanish, you know, this, this part of the thing. And which, which, which means precisely to, to, to posit a one which is not a one which would be a total as one. The one which would get outside of the time, which is a premise of this split, the minus one. It's not a one, it's a minus one. It's a, it's a negative, one is a negative entity. And a totality which, uh, you know, if, if you don't have only one, if you don't have two, and you don't have many, what are you left with? Uh, I think one is left with One plus, one plus something, one plus something, which is not another one, no, neither is it the two. Which would be then the question of otherness. I mean, this is, uh, yes, yeah, they said the question of sexual yes. difference, are the two sexes? Mm -hmm. It's a problem, it's, it's like one plus, but which is not quite two. Well, I have, a, I have thought of what well, linking what you said, of desire, which you are very 